Good evening, I'm Jeremy Greco, and it's time for your Playoff Odds Report. Tonight, the Royals won against the Red Sox, bringing their record to 64-52. The Twins lost, and the Guardians lost twice, so they are now 1.5 games up in the final wildcard spot, half a game behind the Twins for the second wildcard, and five and a half games behind the Yankees and Orioles for the first wildcard spot, but only four games behind the Guardians for the division lead. Before today's action, their baseball reference playoff odds were 61.4%. Also before today's action, their baseball perspective prospectus playoff odds were 40.5%, and their fan graphs playoff odds have been updated for some of tonight's action, but not all of it, to 53.8%, with their wildcard odds sitting at 43.1%, fourth best in the AL. Their magic number after tonight's win and the Red Sox loss is 47. Welcome to the Royals Rundown Podcast presented by Royals Review. It is an after dark edition of Ooh, the podcast. Royals Review Royal- After Hours. I forget who had that uh, who had that comedy bit, but I love it. Yes, we are recording just moments after the final pitch in Wednesday's series finale. Jeremy, they, they threw us off, man. I got kind of into the rhythm. And we have two night games and then an afternoon game. Well, we had three night games in a row. And my sleep schedule can't handle it anymore. Yeah. Tired. We need we need to talk about this, Jeremy. But this game got me all riled up, and I'm so happy. Yes, this was a, this was a roller coaster of a game for sure. It really, really was. And listen, before we get too deep into the action, make sure you go check out RoyalsReview.com. You could have followed along the roller coaster with dozens of other Royals fans out there in the game thread, or you could have known about the entire game's action much sooner in the game recap only on royalsreview.com could they have watched the game to to figure out what happened they can't watch it on royalsreview.com jeremy i think that's illegal sir that's that i mean i don't know it might be illegal but it's also physically impossible (laughs) i mean true so i think my workaround to that right is i would let's say i would go live on our tiktok we can follow our tiktok while we're while we're talking about it and i've seen folks do this with wrestling television shows so i think i it can uh-huh. make it work for baseball they will have one side of their screen make it look like they're a normal gaming streamer right like they have the controller they have the headset whole shebang and then they'll have the the show on the other side and they will <laughs> pre- still seems illegal <laughs> they will pretend the whole time that they're just playing the game and i suck at mlb the show so i would fit right along with the first two games in this series i i do feel like i uh, i'm like i'm actually not opposed to the idea of trying to do of a tiktok live without showing the game but kind of like how riff tracks went from how they yeah. did riff tracks after they did the um the mystery science theater 3000 where they mm-hmm. just create like the audio and you just you could listen to it while you were watching the movie and it and it synced up yep so like you can watch the game and then you have my tiktok live open and i'll be talking to you about the game while you're watching the game i like it i like that idea maybe, maybe we'll have to do that once uh once the postseason push gets a little bit closer. Maybe. But this was about as close to a playoff series as we could get. And I ain't going to lie to you, Jeremy. I've never been more excited to not see the Royals get swept. Okay? Like, this, yeah. this was going to be a rough podcast if they didn't win tonight. You want me on You want me on a Royals rundown after dark, after a sweep? In a series I said they absolutely could not afford to get swept? <laughs> and I, mean, uh, I don't want us to backtrack too much on, on what we said on Sunday night's episode. Because we, we did admit this was a very important series. For the Royals, um, you ran through the through the playoff odds, and let's let's be real, Jeremy. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the Royals got pretty damn lucky with some other teams yep. losing to yep. start off this week, right? Yes, but also like the Guardians are playing the Diamondbacks, who, by the way, are very hot right now. The Royals, yeah, no shame in actually, as it turns out losing two out of three to the Diamondbacks because they're destroying everyone they play right now, including sweeping a doubleheader at Cleveland. Mm -hmm. It is so hard to sweep a doubleheader in a road stadium, and they did it to Cleveland. And Oh, man, yeah, that was – they really gave us a gift there. So uh, appreciate you all, Arizona, now that we don't have to play you again. 
But like, like Jeremy said, Royals are still firmly above. They're f- still firmly 10 digits above 500. Their 32nd comeback win of the season tonight. And they are still only one of six teams to only get swept once or none this season. So they're, they're there, still there are teams that haven't been swept at all yet. Still. Yeah. yeah. Holy cow. I know, right? We, we are late into the season and you would expect like one bad skid from even the best teams, but yeah. apparently not. Apparently not. Three home runs tonight, man. Two from Bobby Witt Jr. What Dude are, is he is he is a living cheat code. He is. Like there's there's no other way to way to put it. This man is is just batting on rookie. And we're we're out here playing on all star. He he's fielding on rookie too. Yeah, he is. That is true. So there is a there's a there's a tidbit that I want to talk about before we forget about it because Bobby Witt Jr. is you talk about oh he's done all this since the All Star break. Well, frankly, dude's been raking all season. He's been all doing year, yeah. amazing. We, we all talked season. last time, and I'm not gonna forget this anytime soon. His worst month of the season was June when he had a 133 WRC plus. <laughs> he, he had it. He was 33 percent above league average, and that was his bad month. <laughs> What a what a disappointment he is, but you're not gonna be disappointed with these. So according to um, I'm I'm gonna butcher this a a Twitter username Addison, Bobby Wood Jr.'s current pace and where it would rank among every single shortstop since baseball was integrated in 1947. Okay, so we're we're going back a good ways here. We're counting Jackie. Yep, his uh, batting average <laughs> at currently sitting at 347. That would be sixth. His Jeez. runs scored would be third. His war, he's on pace for an 11.2 oh war my. season. He got early on the year, I was like, he's on pace for 10. There's no way he keeps that up. It got- that would be first amongst all shortstops since integration. And lastly, that WRC plus you're talking about, 170, which would be first amongst all shortstops since integration. What is this man? <laughs> and he's... <laughs> He's not yet in what would typically be considered the physical prime for a position player. Yep. Still only 24 he, years old. Folks. He could get better. He could. He could could get better, Jacob. <laughs> How? I don't How know. is that a thing? I don't know. Can we talk about Vinny for a second? Yeah. Dude, that was his 17th home run on the season. And this man has been, he's been really good too. I think if Bobby was, you know, average Bobby, we would be talking about Vinny a lot more. Who tonight yeah, I, I found out his first, his full name is Vincent Joseph Pasquantino. I didn't know that. What a, what a name, man. What know, a right? name. Just real quick, want to talk about Vinny, who's had a 112 WRC plus coming into tonight, which isn't great, but also isn't bad. And then I want to like, let's, Let's take the first 11 games out of this. Yeah. Uh, we'll go to the first game when he had an RBI, which was uh, April 10th. Mm-hmm. Okay. And over that span, not including tonight, because Fangraphs has not updated their game log Correct. for that far yet. He's had a 124 WRC plus. That's how bad those first 11 games were. Man. Yeah. He was 124 WRC plus, which is plenty good. Plenty good. It I is. I mean, it's not Bobby Witt Jr., but like nobody is Bobby Witt. I mean, Aaron, Aaron Judge is doing that, Meh. but that's it. Meh. Shohei Otani, that's Meh. it. Like we're talking about like the best of the best of the best. Bobby Witt Jr. Uh, clears mid mid diff mid difficulty. Yes, you get it. All right, no, no. Okay, never mind then. Um, All right, listen. So <laughs> let's see here. Career high, eleven game hitting streak right now and most that of those is, are multi-hit yeah most and most of them are home runs over that streak mm-hmm. these are not these are not like single here single there these are bombs these are rbi doubles these are these are big hits that they are that they are seven of his last seven of his 14 hits have been for extra bases with one double and six home runs since july 30th so man, he's doing really good. And him, I don't know, just his his home run in the when when was it? It was the it was the fourth inning. That was just the that was that was the backbreaker. That I was think. the chef's kiss. That was the Royals got this. It's it's he, over now. 
coming into tonight, Vinny was slashing 378, 397, oh, 22. So an OPS of over a thousand since the All Star break. Wow. 180 WRC plus. Wow. Holy smokes, Vinny. But let's listen, those those two got it done. Folks, folks, this lineup was much better than like their seven hits would tell you, I think. I got to shout out MJ Melendez yes. and Michael Massey yep. for two terrific at bats that got Bobby and Vinny to the plate in the fourth to drive in all those runs. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think those, there was... those were terrific, amazing walks that they took. That is when I'm like, man, and people are like, walks are boring. Hits are cool. When somebody walks like that, when it's like, you know, 10 plus pitches and they're fighting for it and they take a walk. I love it. I love mm -hmm. it. Really, uh, man, it's it's just a professional plate approach, if, that, if that, you will. That is. Yeah. Nick Prado can. I mean, it's no three run nanny, but no. uh, yeah, thanks, it, it, it thanks still gets Rex. me excited. Thanks, Rex, for that uh, for that little gem in there. <laughs> Gonna gonna hang that up on the wall. Three My run part nanny. was he's like it would have been a three run nanny, and and Ryan goes a three run nanny. And he What's goes, yeah, nanny? believe uh, it. And it's like, no, no Rex, you need to explain. <laughs> what are you up. doing? Back up here. I I don't know if his brain just auto corrected to something to nanny from something else, but I I don't know where he could have gotten that from. Um, it was there were a few bees and moments in this game that like had the Royals looking like a competitive lineup, much unlike what they presented times in the first two games. Which I'm, is weird because they scored five runs in each I of those know. games. Exactly. That's, that's a, I mean, you score five runs, you feel like you've got a good chance to win. And they, I mean, they yeah. only lost by one last night. Exactly. And this wasn't a, I don't know. I, I firmly believe first two games, it was on pitching. It was on a, I do think that there were some management blunders at the, at the end of the day. But it happens. Royals, mm. Royals avoid the sweep. They avoid the sweep. They still have a sizable lead over the Red Sox. One of their games. Yep. And on, but unfortunately, they don't have that tiebreaker, which we talked about before. That's very valuable. Jeremy, since since you brought it up first, way like way back when during the first Boston series, I do want to ask, like, how concerning is that in your mind? Well, this is what I was talking about on. Um on Sunday when I was like, they can't, I, I, things get really hard if they lose this series. Yeah. Because they, they can't tie with Boston. Now they have to, they have to be at least one game up on them at the end of the year. Correct. Cause there is no game 163. There is the tiebreakers and the Royals will lose a tiebreaker to Boston. Mm -hmm. So you gotta, we used to root for these six way ties at the end of the season so that we could have fun with a bunch of game 163, 164. No, nope. but no more. Now we're like, yeah, just, just beat them guys. Just beat them. Um, exactly. and so it does get harder. It, I think I may have, and I know this is going to shock you because I am the noted non overreactor. Yes. I may have overreacted cool. a little bit on Sunday. I know you said you don't want to walk it back, but I want to walk it back a little bit. They lost the series. They're still a game. That means they're a game and a half up on the Red Sox. Yeah. And they've still got one more series against the Tigers. And they've still got a good chance to win the division with they Cleveland kind of starting to fall apart. They've got a bunch of games still against Cleveland and Minnesota. They have greater playoff odds on fan graphs than the Red Sox. But the Red Sox have higher wild card odds. That's because hmm. the Royals yeah. have like their fan graph still thinks they have a 10 percent ish chance to win the division. Um, so that's still in play for them, especially exactly. if Cleveland continues to falter down the stretch and if the Royals beat them head to head. That's a, that, that's a good point. I didn't even, uh, I didn't even think about all that. So it is, I don't know, this, this is going to be, so I'm sorry. And, I'm trying to, and, trying to formulate something. I'm, I'm not, I'm not doing so Jeremy, you know, it's a late night. Yeah. The, I just, one thing I just thought of, that also kind of correlates to that is, so let's say the twins stay good. Yeah. They don't falter at all. Twi right. And the Royals can't beat them. The twins are the one AL central team. The Royals haven't really beaten this year. So let's say the twins stay good and the guardian, but the guardians fall and the Royals pass the guardians. Well, guess what? Now the guardians are fighting the red Sox for yep. the third wild card spot. 
Exactly. And the Royals are safely in that second wild card spot. And it's it's four teams. It's the wild card is four teams. It's the loser of the Yankees Orioles, and then it's the Twins right now, and then the Royals and the Red Sox. That's it. Yeah. After the Red Sox, ain't nobody. No. So if you get up into that second spot, you're good. You're safe. Because the it's, other two teams got to fight each other for that third spot. Yeah, it is going to take some extreme luck for another team to emerge in this AL wildcard race. And yeah, maybe maybe we should be pivoting away from talking about the wildcard, settling for the wildcard, and start like seriously looking like, hey, what is this team's path to yeah, the divisional I, crown? I, I know I said on Sunday that I wanted to take one thing at a time, yeah. let's secure the wildcard, and then we can talk about the division. But the way things are going... The division might be more in play than even the wild card, which the Royals currently hold. Correct. So I do I, do want to talk about this, though, Jeremy, because like like we said, this would be a very different podcast episode if not for tonight's win. I personally am am concerned with with the team looking at a postseason at the postseason specifically but also ahead of this run, okay? I the, the Royals do have two off days coming up this week, one tomorrow, one on Sunday. I, those are so going to be huge. They are. They are. They're, they are going to get well-rested, hopefully, but they are getting thrown right into the gauntlet after that. Like, this is, this is going to be the series. Like, I'm not just talking one or two series. We're looking at six or seven, if my count is correct, that are going to be back-to-back-to-back bangers. And this is really going to prove this team's metal, if you will. So, as of right now, heading into an off day, how comfortable are you feeling with this team against a competitive AL team, against a, a postseason contender like we saw in the Boston Red Sox? Well, be it's going to be interesting because, obviously, they didn't look good against the Red Sox. But you yeah. could argue that the Red Sox are a bad matchup for the Royals. Two of their best pitchers, Brady Singer and Seth Lugo. Brady Singer is not good against lefties, and the Red Sox are full of lefties. Yeah. And Lugo has had two subpar starts against the Red Sox now. So the good news there is that if the Royals make the postseason, the Red Sox probably don't, which means you don't have to face them again, but you got to get there first. Yep. And so I'm like, okay, so they didn't do good against the Red Sox, but they did play them tough, and the Red Sox are a bad matchup for them. But then... They also lost two out of three to the Cubs, who were kind of iffy on whether they were competing, going to push for the playoffs or not. Yeah. Lost two out of three to the Diamondbacks, who are very hot right now. Mm -hmm. But still, as you said, we're getting to the point of the year where, you know, I've argued you got to crush the good teams or crush the bad teams and you got to hang with the good teams. Yeah. Well, we're getting to the point of the year where they haven't quite hung with the good teams enough. They're going to have to hang with them a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but when it comes to the good teams, a lot of it is matchup dependent. Again, yeah. they match up poorly against the Red Sox. And when they played the Cubs and the Diamondbacks, they didn't have Lucas Ursag. That's true. Um, and they still were seeing it. They still thought James MacArthur was their closer. Mm-hmm. They've given up on James MacArthur closing right now, which right now is the correct decision i think yeah. he's still a closer in the future but not right now so i think we're moving to you know i think q is making some adjustments obviously i think he made the right calls for the most part both nights the bullpen kind of blew things i know some people said well you pulled the starters earlier or you know but they kind of blew up in his face though it, the sam long call in retrospect may not have been the right call Mm -hmm. Um, He has reverse splits that brought him in to face the lefties. Um, Will Smith, who has been pitching very well, might have been the better call in that situation. And then Will Smith pitches in kind of the four-run non-save situation ninth tonight. So that I kind of expected Hunter Harvey to be there. Hunter Harvey didn't pitch this entire series. Yeah, he didn't. Uh, So I'm not sure what's going on there. But I do think Q is, is kind of gradually moving towards a bullpen that is going to function a little bit better for this team. I think that you've got... I th- you've got four relievers. We talked about this. You've got four relievers. I think you can really count on mm-hmm. in Urseg, Bubich, Long, and I don't remember who Harvey. my fourth one is now. Huh? Harvey. Harvey wasn't my fourth one. Oh, okay. I don't remember who my fourth one was now. Uh-oh. That's uh oh. It doesn't matter. They've got guys that you can kind of you you can count on. So the trick is to not use them when you don't have to, and then you know use those other guys in the situations where there's a lot lot less pressure. As I've kind of talked about everyone in this bullpen does fine when they've got a three or four run lead, which is probably true of most relievers, but still. I do. So you touched on Urseg. I do want to talk about him a little bit because 
uh, bef- like in the eighth inning or so, I put out an all call for questions on, on yeah. Twitter and a couple of them were related to Ursac. So I want to, I want to touch on that. So first off, uh, Josh, Josh Q asks, do you all prefer Ursac in the high leverage situations or as the designated closer that could sometimes get four outs? You know, it's, it's not uncommon to ask a closer to get a four or five out save possibly nowadays in baseball. Hey, I think I've made my thoughts known <laughs> clear on this, Jeremy, and we, we do disagree on this. I would prefer Ursag in the specific high leverage situations. Okay. That could be the seventh, the eighth or the ninth, but and I, I will always listen to your disagreement on this. So it's I, valid. I've had a chance to think about this since Sunday. Okay. And I was reading, I think it was Max put out an article on Royals Review asking, you know, how should the Royals be handling their bullpen right now? And I okay. came up with, I, I don't think that Urseg should be the ninth inning guy anymore. Okay. Um, because Urseg has shown an ability to come in, as he did tonight, with runners on and get out of that. Yep. He left a pitch in the middle that got hit to right field, but hey, it was a routine fly out, as it turns out. <laughs> um, and then he struck out a guy on a nasty sinker or two seam fastball that was like aimed at him and then broke over the middle of the plate at 100 miles an hour. What are you Ooh. supposed to do with that? I don't know. Um, That's a so good fine. question. Sam Long, and we've talked about he's been good. He's not great with uh, runners on. He's allowed 44% of his inherited runners to score. That's not a great percentage. It's not. Um, no. So fine. Sam Long, he's my closer. He's my ninth inning guy. I said, I don't want Urseg in there because I want to have, when Urseg is done pitching, I want the game to be over. Fine. Sam Long, I think, could do that too. So Urseg can be my fireman. Mm-hmm. And then Long can be my closer. And I think that right now, Bubich is my setup man. But I'm willing to mix and match Harvey and Will Smith in there also, though really probably more seventh inning, but I don't you probably don't want to go three straight lefties, seven, eight, nine, and go like Will Smith, Boobich, yeah. Long to finish the game. But you know, these are Will Smith, I think, might have been my fourth guy, but that gives you three lefties and one righty, which is a yeah. little, a little Lo- tough. And Will heavy. Smith is really only against lefties that I trust him. But so that's I'm with you now. Urse okay. can can be a fireman if long is the closer. Gotcha. Okay. I, I do like that. Also, another question that was asked about Urseg, when his Royal from Colin Jekyll, when his Royals career is done, how many career saves will Urseg have with the Royals? He, man. So here, here's one thing about saves. It always depends on the team actually being competitive, being yeah. in those save opportunities. You have to have save situations. Right. Which is actually, even when the Royals have been good this year, a lot of their wins were blowout wins. So they yeah. weren't same situations either. Exactly. Which is one, which is one reason why the amount of James MacArthur blown saves was always frustrating because it was came along so rarely it made them seem worse. But that was something that like held back, say, Scott Barlow from racking up more yeah. saves than he did. I would truthfully, with Urseg's age and his stuff, I mean I'm not seeing the Royals like falling off a cliff in 2025 or 2026. I could see him racking up about 50. Before yeah, that, was, that was my first guess too, was 50 saves. I, but I also don't know that he's going to be the closer the whole True. time. He's exactly. got the closer stuff. But again, I think, I think James MacArthur when he's right is better. Okay. Problem is okay. James MacArthur isn't right. No. Cool. He's got not. it. Yeah. Very I'm wrong. Yeah. I think he will be again, though, and I know I'm really just hammering this point, and nobody believes me, but that's where I'm at. Okay. Hey, I as as long as you make it a make your point competently, it's still a valid point in my book. <laughs> um, so thank thank you guys for for the questions. We'll get to a, a couple of other questions later on in the episode. I do, Jeremy. I'm coming out of left field on this, but there are a couple of other things down on the farm that I want to talk about. If you don't yes, mind, I actually had a couple of things I wanted to talk about too. So let's go. Let's see okay. if we got the same things. Well, I I want. I feel like point number one is the same thing. Jack Caglione, yeah, uh, making his professional debut you, with the high. Did you watch that first bandits. hit? I, I had that double. Yeah. yeah. Did you hear it? <laughs> Ooh, that was that was Ooh, dangerous. That was pretty, and and he here's the th- part that I also love. He's starting in high A. Yeah. Like. Like, right. He could, he could be in double a very early next year. He could. And I put, put as much stock into this as you want, but I found it funny that the, uh, the double a Northwest Arkansas naturals like made a joke alluding to that. Like, Oh, 
All right, well, he might be heading our way soon. <laughs> Here I am. I'm trying to pull up his stats from tonight because I know that he had a hit tonight. Let's see here. Yep, seven ABs, two hits. Um, no, he had that double, and then what was it? Was it a single? Here, I'm sorry. Actually, they don't even well, have his I, you know, log the, up. I, while you're looking that up, let me just throw this out there. I know the Royals said they were going to give him a chance to pitch and hit, but the pitching is clearly behind the hitting. And so what they're probably going to do is go, Jack, you want to pitch? You're going to have to stay in high A. You want to just hit? You can go up to double A. Well, what yep. do you want to do, buddy? Kind of, kind of. He'll, he'll say, let's let's hit the double A. I, I, let's get to the big leagues. I want to I want to get get that big league paycheck, get those big league wins, play with Bobby Witt. Yeah. And I would be surprised if he never throws a professional pitch. I, I wouldn't either. Only wouldn't does either. it in like a mop up situation, you know. And that, <laughs> he'll, he'll be the next Nate, Nate Eaton. That's uh that's what we'll compare him to. Yeah. Um yeah, and they were they were abundantly clear about that after the draft. You know, this is the plan. He's focusing on hitting right now, and then we will talk about pitching uh this offseason. Because again, something that like just talking to players about their offseason programs, I couldn't imagine having to undertake not just one, but two of those. Yeah. That is a lot. Yeah. Uh, and as, like Caglione is far from a polished pitcher coming out of college and let me throw this out there apropos of nothing you can be a two-way player in mm -hmm. mlb the show now right when you do road to the show yeah but man your stats take forever to go up because you got to split <laughs> all your practice time between both pitching and hitting that is true that is that that's why we have to focus on uh clubhouse and rivalries jeremy okay is that is that still a thing i'm still on mlb I, the show i 19? don't think so i don't what? know <laughs> I don't remember that like there's this whole relationship system and i i've played like religiously for two years now picked it up a little more than a year but i picked it up picked up 23 last year at the all-star break mm -hmm. and i play it for hours every week and like so there's a relationship system but i do not understand i'll just be like i'll get it out and it'll be like chris boobich is now your friend and i'll be like why <laughs> Well, I uh, I unfortunately made friends with Hunter Dozier on the game, and that was <laughs> that was my mistake. It really, really was. But the other the other minor league note that I wanted to talk about is top thirty prospect Steven Zobak, uh, who we've had on the podcast before. He had an absolutely stellar showing for the Northwest Arkansas Naturals that we were talking about. Seven innings of shutout ball, only allowing two hits with twelve strikeouts. Twelve. <laughs> All right, this is this is the man who's making headlines in 2023 as a reliever for his strikeout streak. Now, that is starting to transition more over to the rotation, which is very like I I kind of get chills about it because I remember yeah. watching some of his appearances in Columbia and he's he's good when he is good, he is great as we saw yeah. tonight. Uh, what, what was your other minor league note that you wanted to talk about? So, uh, speaking of the bullpen, Evan yes. Sisk pitching very yeah. well in Omaha as a left-handed reliever. And an interesting note tonight. Uh, let me see if I can if I can throw a hat tip out to somebody for this one. Of course, of course. Um, I got to figure out who tweeted it, and of course, okay. Twitter is dead slow now. Of course, it um, is. David Mayer, oh eight tweeted Chandler Champlain throwing in the Omaha bullpen tonight. Oh, so, I, I don't know if it means anything. Maybe he mm. just needed some work, but it definitely made me go chin scratches. <laughs> like, hmm, interesting. Hmm. Royals need bullpen help. One of our better pitcher prospects is in the bullpen. Hmm. Uh, yeah, and he's, he, I, I think Preston commented on that as well, and I, I concur with what he said. Like, Champlain has, has the stuff. All right, mm -hmm. he he has the stuff to be a low end rotational piece at a ceiling, but if they're moving him to the to the bullpen for say like a September call up or something like that, that's uh, that's a pretty good reinforcement to get. Speaking of September call ups, we do yes. have another question asking okay. us for our September call up predictions. Okay, uh, you do you have that pulled up? Yeah, well, it's just ask. He just said, "What are yours?" It was Brett Myers, okay. a fan seven, mm -hmm. asking us. What are our September call-up predictions? Uh, I, mean, I know mine that, off the top that, of my head. Well, who who's yours off the top of your head? Because I have a I have a gut feeling who it is. John Schreiber and Tyler Gentry. Okay. Hey, I I can't disagree with Tyler Gentry at all. You I can was only call up one pitcher. Correct. So, 
which is it's going to make things a little, a little tough. And Schreiber, little Schreiber apparently threw today for the first time without a knee brace. That's good. So he's he's not going to be ready for a minute, and they would have to clear a roster spot. You know, somebody would. Ha- the only guys they can demote are Zerpa, MacArthur. I mean, you could demote MacArthur and, and bring in Schreiber. And, and yeah. at this point, I. I think the Royals could benefit from demoting MacArthur just because Maybe. they're not going to give him any leverage innings anyway. Yeah. And so if you've got a Chandler Champlain or Jonathan Bolin, who's looked good in the bullpen at times mm-hmm. or an Evan Sisk that you want to take a look at, or even a Steven Cruz, just to give you like, can somebody add a little bit of depth to the back end of this bullpen? Yeah. MacArthur's got options. I think, so I think that might be the way to go. So probably the, least sexiest option out there but pro- one of the most viable that folks aren't talking about dan altavia um he started his rehab appearances with the omaha storm chasers i don't have his stats for his rehab appearances in front of me um but from what i am hearing he is still very much in the clubhouse's plans for okay. this season because i if you before you said that my first thought was so he's gonna finish his rehab and immediately get cut <laughs> I, as of right now, a lot of, a lot of things can change. I think he, he's got like three weeks remaining on his rehab yeah. appearance. Um, so a lot can change between now and the end of that, but he's still viewed as reinforcements. So that could take up one of those September call-up spots. Still, still technically on the 40 man roster, just uh, on the 60 day IL as of right now. Which means uh, they would have to clear a 40 man spot to get yeah. him back as well, which Correct. is. That's that's a big ask. It it is it is especially for, I no no offense to Altavia, he's carved out a nice MLB career for himself. But are you if gonna? But if we're carving out a forty man spot, do you want Altavia, or do you want to look at Champlain, Champlain. who you're who you're gonna need to add sooner or later? Or do you want to look at Evan Sisk, who you're gonna have to add sooner or later? Correct. So there's there's definitely I I think we can all agree that bullpen help is coming from internally from the farm system and well, it's not coming externally well i don't know there's a there's some facebook comment sections that are still calling for a certain pitcher down in uh down in mexico to join any mlb team <laughs> um, i gotta tell y'all if if here's the thing if, uh, if a certain if a certain outage guy was still capable of getting outs at the major league level feel like a team would have taken a shot on him yeah is it like the top pit the top batter in that league nelson cruz or something like that i have like, no idea is. i just i just know that professional teams have shown a remarkable willingness to forgive and forget when guys have talent in all sports and if they're not forgiving and forgetting it's probably because he doesn't have talent and or he's a clubhouse problem yeah, it, it, the the legal <laughs> troubles. Yes. Let's see. What was the other? So I, a couple of the guys down on down in Omaha that we do have to talk about. I I get it. Nick Lofton didn't really have a whole lot of success up here at the major league level. He is doing what he can control to uh, to make his way back onto the roster. Um, I don't think Nick Prado is going to push for a September call up or return at all. I think Tyler Gentry's like the like the guy. Like I want to see this guy. Um, and I mean, he's been hitting hot. He yeah. was a top prospect. Yeah. There's there's no one else down there. No, exactly. And I'm trying to have a defensive replacement for Hunter Renfro. Which thank goodness for a moment. <laughs> let me just say, like I get it. Hunter Renfro has no range, but can we at least give him credit for always goes a hundred percent? He does. He and does. if he gets to the ball, he catches it. Yeah. Which like he we're not he, used to that. He might not get there, but if he does get there, it will be caught. There are a lot of outfielders we've seen on other teams this yeah. year who get to the ball and it just clunks off their glove. Mm-hmm. Hunter Renfro is, is pretty sure-handed when it comes to it, and also he doesn't you know spike the ball into the ground when he tries to throw it. <clears throat> Kyle Isbell. But there is one more question. Talk about roster moves that we should address. Chris Chris, Chris OKC. I believe is how you say it. Asked, would y'all make any roster moves during tomorrow's off day? And if so, what would they be? Um, Jeremy, a, say it. Just say it. I would cut Adam Frazier and promote Tyler Gentry. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. This is breaking, folks. 
All right, this is brand new. We've never heard Jeremy say this before that he would cut Adam Frazier or exchange for any I am, hot I am a noted Adam Frazier fan and not a person who was like, yeah, sure, he had a game winning home run against the Angels, but I don't really need him around. Now, I did advocate at one point for him to be the leadoff hitter or for him to be in the lineup more often <laughs> yeah. because he was hot for like a couple of weeks. While everybody else was floundering around, but I was never thought that was a permanent solution no um all speaking of veteran bench guys i have put out on a milk carton to be displayed tomorrow i am looking for paul de young okay i he is missing we well, okay. don't know where he is boston only has one left-handed reliever he's he's here to hit the lefties yeah you're right and then he hit the lefty young. just fine tonight thank yeah, you he did. yeah he did didn't he um i'd Listen, if, if we don't see any of Paul DeYoung against the St. Louis Cardinals, I have more questions than answers. <laughs> Come on, the guys the guy hasn't given you a reason not to not to put him in the lineup. But like you said, the matchups against Boston did not present themselves as beneficial. So that's smart baseball at the end of the day. That is all of our que oh, I guess I didn't even answer Chris's question. Truth out outside of Adam Frazier right now, I I wouldn't make any moves. I would I would stand pat heading into the um heading into tomorrow's off day, ride with this twenty six man roster through the Cardinals two game set, and then okay, well we're about to take the flight up to Minneapolis. What's uh what what are we looking like? You know, o- Omaha Omaha is is on the way. It's kind of in the same direction as Minneapolis. So maybe maybe we could pick up some folks on the on the way. Go go see the Omaha Zoo you or think, something you think like they're that. Doing layovers <laughs> on the the Royals charter flights. I don't I don't know their plans. I don't know no. the logistics. Jeremy, are there like we said multiple times? It is late. Is there uh, is there anything else you're wanting to touch on or things that we're missing? And Cole Reagan's, I felt. Was, yeah. was pretty good tonight. He he kind of got he found the rare opportunity to allow fewer earned runs than home runs. Can't say I remember seeing that before. Uh, Box score. I'm sure it's I have it, it's got to have happened probably hundreds of times <laughs> just in MLB history. But uh, this is the first time, I, and it's also marked the third time this year that Paul Reagan's has been charged with a home run because of somebody else's mistake. Oof. It's just the first time it was somebody on his team who made the mistake <laughs> um, instead of an umpire in New York. So, yeah. but yeah, um, Cole Reagan's velocity was up back up a little bit again tonight. Am I am keeping a close eye on Seth Lugo, who over okay. his last five starts has has a 4.54 ERA um, since his last start again, that start against Boston right before the All-Star break. He, he's been kind of flipping back and forth. Yeah, um, He gave up the five runs in five innings to Boston, then one run in nine innings to the White Sox, then yeah. six runs in six and a third to the Cubs, then one in eight to the Tigers, and then four earned runs. Uh, to the against the Red Sox uh, yesterday again the unearned runs a lot of unearned runs given up by the Royals in this series and they are yeah. a team that has the fewest unearned runs this year so yeah. let's, uh, let's clean up the the defense a little bit guys mm-hmm. uh, Michael Massey I'm also keeping an eye on uh, the defense obviously has been subpar and he's a guy who won a minor league gold glove award which yeah. they don't just give to anybody and you have to be the best at your position in the entire minor leagues, not just in your league. And so he's a guy who has a defensive reputation, but he's not been doing very well. I'm wondering if that has something to do with the back issues he's been experiencing. He's overthinking things because he's worried about pain or because he's worried about injuring himself and potentially, you know, losing more time. If that's going to continue to be an issue, then might be time to try and DH him more often than not again. Those are a couple things I'm keeping an eye on. And I am I am a little scared about that possibility because if that's the case, then that's going to solidify Adam Frazier's roster spot for the remaining. For the Michael Garcia the can play second. He's played a very good second, and then Paul DeYoung yeah. can play third. That's true. It just puts up. Since also here to play second, it takes it takes another takes another lefty out of the out of the circulation, if you will, because we would oh, talked about DH him. You're fine. Just yeah. DH him. Okay. Okay. I I stand corrected. He, he and Fermin can, can, I mean, Fermin, I like Fermin in there a lot. He doesn't need to play every day. 
Yeah, four, four or five times a week is what I would yeah. like. Realistically, you're going to get three and, or and four. And I think Massey can play second base sometimes. Yes. Yeah. Just, just give him more DH days. Exactly. So we will uh, we'll see how the team regroups with their off day on Thursday ahead of the two game set against the visiting. Yes, they are they are in Kansas City against the visiting St. Louis Cardinals. If you, if you for, I believe they swept the Cardinals last go around. Swept, swept the way doubleheader. Yeah. Um, so that'll. So uh, this is this is a series. This is another home series. Cardinals are not an easy team, but they're, they're not. not the hardest team they're going to face. No, uh, and it's it's a home two two game series. The weird Friday, Saturday, Sunday off day. But yeah. again, those off days are huge right now for this rotation where pitchers are looking a little drained. Yeah, I'm a little tired. Give them a couple couple extra days off. Uh, I'm also looking forward to getting to the postseason and getting them a few extra days off. I know I'm way ahead of myself, but I'm wondering if the Royals might be best served to go with like a five get five and rotation even in the playoffs Oof. just to give extra time off to their starters maybe um as they're all going to be way over their their innings by the time we get to the end of september for sure and that is that's something that we're going to be keeping tabs on over at royalsreview.com because that's a that's not this is not a niche storyline like this is something that folks are keying in on around the league because this is the royals rotation has been so great that the haters are looking for a demise. They're looking for the shortfall. And frankly, this innings workload is looking like it might be a shortfall. So we need to to keep a close eye on it. Jeremy, I don't have anything else right now. I do think we need to get to our reviews and then get on out of here. Sound good to you? Let's do it. So I'll I'll go and kick it off real quick. Uh, Katie and I went out to uh, a shelter out in rural Virginia. It's about a 40-minute drive from us. Um, called Isle of White Animal Shelter, and we uh, we rescued a, a couple of Maine Coons on Tuesday. Um, and these aren't these these aren't your your grandpa's Maine Coons, all right? They're, they're not itty bitty little little cats, okay? These are these are big dog or big dog cats. Big dog cats. <laughs> yes. I was trying to give I was trying to give one a cat treat earlier, and it sat. I'm not I'm not kidding you. All right, it sat, and it is it's bigger than our first dog. It's about as big as our beagle right now as well. One These are 3. 3 they grow up to three point three feet long, according oh to goodness. according to Honey. Uh, I know they barely fit in a McDonald's play place. <gasps> cats are they are they tall enough to ride a roller coaster? Maybe I don't think so. Okay, I think you got to be taller than that. Yeah, fair. And probably um, have opposable thumbs. That, yeah, true. And, you know, not have the ability to wiggle their way out of the harness. Um, uh, yes, that that's what we talk about on the Kansas City Royals baseball podcast, the uh, the logistics behind a cat riding a roller coaster. But, yeah, the, love love these type of cats. I I, pref- I like the big cats. I do. Um, and we lost our our first cat that we got was a, was a runt, sickly Maine Coon. Um, and we lost him a little while ago, so it's good to uh, to have a little bit of healing. Have a Maine Coon back in the house. So if you uh, if you see that see that breed and you're more of a dog person, I do think that is about a, a dogly cat as you are going to get. So Maine, Maine Coons, Coons, we like them. With dog software. Did you hear that, Jeremy? Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> it's, hey, it's the way it goes. Jeremy, on to you. Oh, uh, I'm going to re- review not a show that I'm watching currently, but a show that I've watched in the past. I've been ripping my Blu-rays. I I talked about that recently about ripping all my anime Blu-rays. I've been ripping my Blu-rays this week of Yu Yu Hakusho, um, which is a terrific anime, a shonen anime. Um, And everybody knows that the best part of shonen anime are the tournament arcs. Yes. And Yu Yu Hakusho is like 80% tournament (laughs) arcs. Mm-hmm. So uh, just a really fun show brings me a lot of joy. I'm looking forward to having an excuse to rewatch it along with uh, a bunch of my other favorite anime. The, the, the finger gun. Like that was like my introduction yeah. Yeah. to, uh, to anime. My, um, my favorite, my favorite part is the, the, the detective kit he gets early on. Cause he's, oh, the, yeah. he's the spirit detective. Yeah. And then they like completely abandon that. And I'm like, mm-hmm. so that looks like that feels like it was made like, you know how in the eighties they made cartoons just to sell toys, like Transformers was and GI Joes were just existed to sell the toys. Felt like this was created to sell the spirit detective kit, 
and then they were like never mind uh, let's go punch some guys yeah yeah let's make this a little bit simpler but yeah that is honestly that is a pretty fun anime to watch i i do enjoy it um all right that is going to do it for tonight's royals rundown podcast make sure to follow along with the work over at royalsreview.com Jeremy has excellent work going out over there along with the rest of the crew. Thank you to them for making this podcast happen. If you want to follow along with us on social media, you can do that too, and we appreciate it. Our links to our X feeds, our Twitter feeds, excuse me, are down in the podcast description below. Um, hopefully hopefully we'll have Greg on in the in the couple of weeks. Um, I know we haven't asked him, but we should. We probably, probably should do that. Right? Hey, Greg, hey, if you're listening... Blink Would you like twice. To podcast with us again, <laughs> please, please, Greg. <laughs> uh, no, but we'll, uh, we'll we'll see who we can scrounge up in the next couple of weeks for a podcast guest. My name is Jacob Milham. He is Jeremy Greco. Thank you for joining us this evening, and until next time, go Royals in a three-run nanny. It's time for bed. <laughs>